If I were to go out on Michigan Avenue right now and ask 10 people what sustainability means to them, the word environment would be uppermost. Environment. And sustainability is about the environment, but it's about so much more. It's about equity and social justice as well. And I don't need to tell you, living in the city that you live in, how important issues of equity and justice are in issues of access to quality environments. So I'm going to make the case that environmental quality and human equality are actually linked. It's not necessarily a causal link, but there is a correlation between environmental quality and human equality. So my talk is called Toward Just Sustainabilities. Um, I don't like to have to put a prefix to the word sustainability. I would like to just use the word sustainability, and everybody understood it as a broad concept. But I put the word there to counteract this oft-used prefix, environmental sustainability. So what do I mean by just sustainability? Well, just sustainability is improving people's quality of life now and into the future in a just and equitable manner while living within the limits of ecosystems. So don't get me wrong. Living within the limits of ecosystems is our umbilical cord. It's the connection to the planet. But we need to consider social justice considerations. Much of what I see as sustainability has what I call an equity deficit. There is a deficit of discussions around social justice. So with that, let me uh, go on to my talk. The picture there is my favorite picture um, because it reminds me that... Um, urban planning, sustainability, should not be about what is probable, but, what about, but be about what is possible. I mean, how many, you know, how many times could we even think that might happen when we were younger, that Broadway would become a shared street? And that was right at the very beginning. We can have a different reality. We can make places different. The young woman there is blissed out in the moment of transgressing, standing there in the middle of a busy street near Times Square and just looking at the possibility all around her. So with that, I want you to think about what is possible as I go through my talk. So I'm going to take three aspects of this concept called just sustainability. There's lots of other aspects, but I can take three over my 15, 20 minutes that I've got to talk. Space and place, food and culture. You might think three very um, unrelated issues, but they're not, and I'm hoping you'll see some links between them as I go through the, the, the talk. So the first issue in terms of space and place is a new term, I think, to many of you. It's called spatial justice. And as the quote there from David Lammy, a British Member of Parliament, says, just as social justice requires that life chances are not distributed along class lines, spatial justice requires that they're not distributed geographically. If ever there was a city where opportunity was distributed geographically, it would be your city. You have some very clear boundaries. One side of the tracks, life is good and long and prosperous. The other side of the tracks, it's not so good and long and prosperous. Spatial justice is the spatial component of social justice. And we have a very powerful tool for looking at that these days, geographical information systems. We can see social justice playing out on the city's streets. But what I want to do, just to concretize this a little bit, is to give you some ideas of how spatial justice plays out and how it's important to this concept of just sustainability. So, two streets here. Streets are the most common public space. We use that public space, the street, every day. Many of you probably don't think much about streets. I spend a lot of time sitting in coffee shops thinking about streets. And I've sat in Frank's on Sodra Vegan, and I sit in Simon's on Massachusetts Avenue, and I watch streets. I nerd out on streets. <laughs> and when I sit on Mass Ave, and that's looking down towards Harvard Law School, when I sit on Mass Ave, I see a street that's the same width as Sodra Vegan in Gothenburg, exactly the same width, but the organization of the street's very different. On Massachusetts Avenue, the rule of the road is the bigger your vehicle, the more rights you have to the street. <laughs> That's the way it goes, isn't it? Bigger is better. That's not the case in Sweden. In Sweden, the Swedes have imposed spatial justice on the streets. They have democratized their streets such that pedestrians, cyclists, transit users have more rights 
than vehicular users. You can see, if you look very closely, uh, to the left of the streetcar, there is about 15% of the streetscape given over to private vehicles. Now, leave you with a question. I don't have an answer for this, but I'm going to leave you with this question. How does the kid growing up on that street understand the world differently to the kid growing up on Mass Ave who sees that might is right, bigger is better? How, does, how is a Swedish kid wired differently from an American kid as a result of that? Now, we have some very good um, data on this. Uh, Dan Appleyard, back in the 1970s, did some work in San Francisco, and these were his street sketches. He looked at three streets, but there's two on here. One is a street with light traffic, 2,000 cars a day. The other one is a street with heavy traffic. On the lightly trafficked street, people had three friends, on average, per person, and 6.9 acquaintances. On the heavily trafficked street, 0.9 friends per person, or 3.1 acquaintances. What's the moral of the story? The greater the velocity and volume of traffic on the street, less social interaction. So again, we have data on this. It's, it, it's not rocket science. We need to share our streets. We need to rethink streets for people. Spatial justice on the street, democratize our streets. Another example that I think fits in with some of the, uh, the work that uh, you're doing here in Cook County with your forests is work on urban parks. Now, this book, and I don't usually advertise other people's books. I'm a, an academic. I'd like you to buy my book. But I'm going to advertise two books, two books in addition to mine. I'm going to advertise two books. This one I think you should look at. Rethinking Urban Parks, Public Space and Cultural Diversity. Usually it's public space and biodiversity parks, isn't it? But this book specifically looks at cultural diversity. And the headline from the book is, in this new century, we're facing a different kind of threat to public space. Not one of disuse, but one of patterns of design and management. Design and management that exclude some people and reduce social and cultural diversity. Design and management is excluding people. Let me give you two examples. Both of them are from the UK. Number one, I was asked in about 1990 to look at a park very much like that in what's called the Green Belt in the north of London. So Hertfordshire County Council was the county uh, that owned most of this Green Belt land, and in one of the particular parks, they had a problem. A lot of um, the, the design issues of the park didn't fit the people who were now using the park. The park was designed 150 years ago, when North London looked very different. I walked around the park, I saw these extended groups of Asian, Turkish, Greek, Cypriot people, extended groups. And I noticed the park benches were all small benches. Where do people sit? The design of the furniture in the park did not fit the users of the park. Why not have a forum style so that the whole group could sit down? A design issue which was culturally divisive. A management issue, I want to give you an example of a, an ecological management issue that was equally divisive. In Bristol, in southwest England, the city parks department were persuaded by the local wildlife trust to develop wildflower meadows. Great idea. I'm an ecologist. I like wildflower meadows. So over two or three years, they employed a management regimen which um, developed a deep sward of native wildflowers. Great. Everybody thought it was great. Apart from somebody who noticed that African Caribbean and Asian people weren't going anywhere near the long grass. A residual fear of snakes. An ecological management regimen that was having a negative cultural effect. Now, I'm not saying it was wrong to do that, to put an ecological uh, a, a, a nature garden there, a wildflower meadow there. I'm not saying that's wrong. But we need to ask questions that we're not asking. Maybe if one of the parks department or one of the wildlife trusts had been from one of these minority groups, maybe that question might have asked, been asked. So there's an implication here that we need more diversity working in our environmental professions. But again, let's start asking the questions. If, an, if a, a wildflower meadow was the solution, what was the question we asked? Food. I'm very interested in food at the moment um, in the sense that 
it's a great place to start conversations about environment. I wouldn't start talking to somebody about climate change. I would start with talking about food. Everybody's fascinated with food and what people eat. But usually, and most of the, the food movement, is about nutrition. It's about the nutritional quality of food, not about other issues. What about food as performance? These two women are from Oaxaca in Mexico, and they've created this little garden. What they've done is they've created or they've performed their identity on the landscape. That's what an autotopography is. Autotopography is inscribing one's culture and one's self, one's community, on the landscape. It's about making a place, and it's very important for these immigrants because not only do they want to eat culturally appropriate food, but they want to create a little bit of home here. So food is performance. Let's think about that. And let's think about that as a way in to bring people into the food movement who maybe don't look like most people who are currently in the food movement. Let's open up our ideas. And I'm going to give you other ideas about how to do that as well. This is New Roots Farm in San Diego. Um, there are 80 farms around the country, one of which is run by Tufts University in Boston, specifically for training refugees, new immigrants, in agriculture. These are the new farmers, and they're going to be found in places like Burlington, Vermont, Phoenix, Arizona. They're the new agriculturalists, and they've every right to do what they do and to grow different uh, foods and crops. But when we talk about the local and growing local, which is this buy local, grow local mantra that we seem to be getting from the food movement, what is local? Is it geographically local? Because that sign for African produce there isn't in Africa. That's at George Bowling's farm in Maryland. George and his wife are tobacco farmers, and they suddenly notice there's 140,000 Africans in the DC metro area and they want to eat African food. So George and his wife have been working with the African community to find out what will grow in Virginia, oh, sorry, in Maryland. And they've got a great business, and anything that gets rid of tobacco farming is good by my book, but they've got a very good little business here. So what we're doing here is we're, we're making a problem around the notion of local. I understand that you know, people want, you know, a lot of ecologically minded people say, only grow what should grow here. But that is being a little bit um, exclusive in a world which is becoming increasingly different and diverse. And we need to think differently about local in the context of uh, our increasingly diverse urban areas. Similarly, in the Philippines, uh, sorry, in, in San Diego, the Filipino communities there, when asked about what local food means to them, they say, well, Filipino food, my food is local food. So the concept now is translocal identities, that a lot of people in a lot of cities don't see what grows in Massachusetts or what grows in Chicago as being local. It's what they grow in their lives that is local. Again, there's a notion of reflexivity here that I think we need to take into account when we think about uh, some of the imagery we put forward as being as what's wholesome food. The final um, area that I want to touch on is this notion of culture. I'm really interested in the notion of interculturalism. Um, in Europe, it's seen that multiculturalism has failed. Multiculturalism, we used to joke in London in the 80s, was steel drums, saris, and samosas. That was what multiculturalism was about, and that you had those at school, and then you sort of dressed up and played steel drums and ate samosas, and that was multiculturalism. So the... The idea, though, now is that worked for a while. That gave us some thought about um, difference and diversity. But what about changing the institutions around us? The institutions, if they don't change, then we're not going to change our societies. And I give the example of Boston. Boston is now a majority-minority city. But the institutions haven't changed in recognition of that. The institutions haven't changed a bit. We still think of Cheers and Ali McBeal, but we don't think of all of the difference that is in Boston. Boston is now a very different city to when I came there 15 years ago, and it will be different in 15 more years. Now, another book I'm going <laughs> to publicize here is this one, The Intercultural City, uh, Planning for Diversity Advantage. 
It's a fabulous book, a really easy read that really asks the question, at what point do cities start to see diversity as less of a cost, a drag on scarce resources, and the mind-numbing complexity, and start to see it as a force, a resource, and an opportunity? Now, let's take a step back. 40 years ago, most multinational corporations looked at their workforces and realized that diversity was an issue. But they didn't do it just through some altruistic notion. They did it because they wanted to get into new markets. And the best way to get into new markets is to start looking like the people you're going to sell to. So 40 years ago, most big corporations started to look at diversity, not only to get into new markets, but a lot of research in business journals has shown that Creativity and diversity go together. The more diverse your workforce, the more creative it can be. So businesses get it. Why don't our cities seem to understand that? Why do most cities still manage diversity, tolerate diversity, but don't fully embrace diversity as being something that is an opportunity, a resource? And I think of cities around the world. I don't know many cities that really embrace diversity. Maybe Toronto, maybe London, although Rob Ford is taking the, um, the lead in ter taking Toronto's diversity to different levels. But <laughs> I think, you know, and maybe Amsterdam, you know, so there's a few cities around the world that, that actually do embrace it. But think about it, and you know your city better than me. Do you embrace diversity? I remember one great day that I had in Millennium Park, and the... Um, there's a sort of sculpture, and it changed, morphed into all the different faces. I thought that was fabulous, a real statement of presence. So what I want you to think about, though, is this idea of the intercultural city ecosystem. Um, one of the pieces that I wrote for the Center for Humans and Nature was about this notion that, uh, and we've heard the concept of native plants, um, aren't cities places where things mix? I mean, I look at cities around the world, and there's some very interesting stories of plants. For instance, there's a plant called Oxford ragwort. Doesn't that sound English? Oxford ragwort. It's actually from Mount Etna. It's from the slopes of Mount Etna, and it's spread in England with the railways because the fire used in the, the, fires in, in the, in the fireboxes in the trains uh, mimicked the volcanic slopes of Etna. So you can trace this plant around Britain. Okay, you can trace it by the uh, advent of the railways. Now, what a great story to tell kids. The linkage between economic development there and a non-native plant. And so m I worry a little bit when we talk about uh, purity in nature when we have diversity in our cities. So my concept then is the intercultural city ecosystem. And I think if you start to think in those broader terms of culture and nature you come to this conclusion that our cities are places where things mix. And that's a lot of what makes them very exciting. And if you want to um, read more about this, really read this book. I think this <laughs> is the one I've been saving till last. I kept the best till last. Introducing Just Sustainability's Policy Planning and Practice. Thank you.